So welcome everyone. Good morning from the Dallas area, Dallas, Texas. Lynn is not in Dallas, Texas. No, I'm um, not. <laughs> nope, she's across the pond over in the United Kingdom. And I just want to welcome you to Living Free, which is the name of my YouTube channel, the name of my podcast. And Living Free is all about living free, right? Stepping into the freedom that Christ paid for when he shed his blood on the cross, that we have this access to a life of freedom, access to the abundant life that he came to give us so that we can be free of things like depression, free of anxiety, free of bitterness, free of unforgiveness, free of all various different things and mindsets that would hold us captive. So that's what this is about. And one of the things that I am doing as part of, um, you know, bringing quote unquote, uh, I don't want to say bringing, I don't know, maybe this is the right word, bringing freedom to you guys or giving you access to this freedom is to share other people's stories, other people's testimonies that carry that braver anointing that would stir faith in your heart, stir, stir hope in your heart. And I'm not talking about worldly hope. I'm not talking about, well, maybe this works, maybe this doesn't. No, I'm talking about divine hope, which is an expectation that something good is going to happen that this morning I was in my quiet time and the Lord showed me Romans 8, is it 8, 8 something? <laughs> Romans 8 something, was it 838? Where he says, you know, uh, that he causes all things, all things, right? Even the things that the enemy throws at you in your life, he causes all of those things to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to their purpose. And so in the Greek and in the Hebrew, the word all means all. <laughs> right? So with all that being said, today I am I have the honor and the privilege of introducing you to a dear friend, Lynn, over in the UK and sharing her story. And I will share some of mine as well as we go along. This is going to work very much just like a casual fireside chat, just a casual interview. We'll share parts of our testimony of overcoming abuse and, and then talk about how we were able to overcome all of that through the power of forgiveness. So Lynn, would you like to... Um, Tell us a little bit about your story. Oh, yes. Thank you so much, Lily, for, for doing this, for hosting me. And thank you so much to, to all the listeners out there. We're just expecting for a very good conversation that will, you know, leave you maybe a bit challenged if you're facing, you know, if you're in a place of, you know, grappling with shall I forgive or shan't I? So, yes, uh, as Lily said, my name is Lynn. I'm, I'm here in the UK, sunny UK for a change. Yes. Praise the Lord. So um, my story um, began uh, of, of physical abuse began when um, I was married to my first husband and um, I had we had just had our son. He was about, I think, maybe two months old. So that's when the physical abuse um, started before there was just the emotional abuse the mental abuse so the, the the name calling the you know it's just the undermining things that make that made me doubt myself that okay did, did I you know what's wrong with me what why did, maybe it's something that I did wrong so it's all these mind games you know and it, it then turned physical when our son was two months old as I said and then that was like okay what is going on here but then you know what as as I think it's it's a, it's a woman thing that you know you really want to make your marriage work you really want to make sure that you've done all you can to do and which I tried and uh looking back if I had moments I remember God knocking at my heart saying okay Lynn come to me and I'm like and I'll be like okay yes God just give me a minute I just need to get this marriage sorted out first <laughs> and then I'll come to you <laughs> so obviously <laughs> That did not work that way at all. My situation got worse and worse and worse until I remember playing uh, football with my son at the time. He was about maybe uh, five, years, five years old in the park. And then I was kicking the ball about. And then I just thought to myself, you know, I was just in such a dark place, such a dark place. And I just felt, and I just asked myself, God, well, I was asking God really, but not really talking to God because I put him on hold. So I was really thinking, is this the sum total of my life to just live a miserable life? And at the end of my age, just 
my years just die and then that's it. And then I heard a resounding audible voice say, no, that shook me. You know, I, I was really startled. I turned around to see who was, you know, who was close to me. There was no one. And then I just went away. But then that sound, it wasn't just an audible sound that I heard. No, it is like it imparted something in my heart. I just felt this, I mean, this fight in me saying, you know, just thought this is not the sum total of my life. There is more to my life. So the following uh, morning, what I did, I, I woke up very early, watched the sunrise, and then um, I really turned my attention to God. My focus was really on him. And I said, God, if you can get me out of this situation, please do it. I don't, I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't know, but I need you to get me out of the situation. And friends, I kid you not. The following day, my uh, then husband came to me with a note. He just kind of handed, casually handed it to me and walked off. And then I opened the note and it said, oh no, it, no, he said, uh, take this to housing. So housing is here in England is a place where you get rehoused if you're made homeless. So as he walked off, I was, I was thinking housing. So as I walked, um, as he walked off, I opened the note and it said, um, he had written, I do not want this woman and her son living with me anymore. So there was that all that, that detachment already. This woman and her son. So I man, I, I took the note, I looked at it and just thought, okay, what is this? What am I reading? What, and, you know, so it took me a few minutes to gather that, oh my gosh, he wants me out of the, he wants me out of the house. He, that's what he wants, basically. So then. I then I remember the prayer I'd said the follow the, the previous day of God, whatever you need to do, do it. So I just took that as answered prayer. I was like, hallelujah in my heart. So I packed our little bags, packed our bags, uh, a suitcase for my son, a suitcase for myself, we presented ourselves homeless. And we were um, we were then uh, put in a like a shelter, like a halfway house a shelter here. And then uh, what happened? A few days, no, it was a few, a couple of weeks later, uh, it, it was like a Pharaoh moment. He realized what he had done, that he had let me go, but no, okay, he just, he wanted me to come back. So then I'm not sure how this happened, but he found us, he tracked us down and he found where we were. And then uh, he just, you know, we were having breakfast in the morning. I was getting ready. My, my son was getting ready for school. I sat at the table and the door was just kicked in. And we were like, oh my goodness, what's going on? He dragged my, us, my son uh, out the door, shut the door. And then that's when he proceeded to just attack me, kick me, punch me. All those, all those kind of things. I was just cradling myself, just on the floor thinking, Lord, what is going on here? Uh, because everything just happens so quickly to peacefully, one minute peacefully having breakfast, the next, the door being kicked in and being attacked. And then um, I remember him taking the knife and saying, you know, just asking me all sorts of questions. And then after that, he took, uh, took me in his car, took my son as well, and he threatened me. He said, if you try and do anything whilst we're out there, remember. I've got our son back. And he, he pointed the knife at me like, you know, I'm going to do something. So then with that, we just drove around, drove around, drove around aimlessly, really. I didn't, I, I think he hadn't thought it through like, okay, after I do this, what am I going to do with her? So we just <laughs> yeah. drove around for hours, drove around for hours. And then we stopped at like near a, a high street here, a high street is what you'd call sort of like a mall. But on a, a on a yeah, it's not upstairs or anything like that. There are no stairs. It's just a street lined with different types of um, clothes show, uh, shops and furniture shops. And then he parked by uh, by one of the women's shop. And then he looked at a a dress that was on the window. And he says, "Oh, do you want us to go in and get you that?" So I was thinking, "What? Are you serious?" And I said, "No." And then he kept quiet. And he and then he and then he just said, "Okay, uh, what do you want to do?" And I said, "Well, you know what." Um, 
I'll, I'll really appreciate it if you took me to the hospital because I'm in such pain at the moment. I think something is broken. I just need to go and be seen, uh, checked out by a doctor. At that, he, he didn't say anything else. He started the car up again, and then we drove off, drove around for a bit. And then the next thing I know, we are at an A&E, accident and emergency. Uh, so, and he says, he didn't say anything. He just parked the car right at the main entrance. And then I just thought, okay, so I'm going to get out of the car. So I got out of the car. And as soon as I got out of the car, he sped off uh, with our son. So he still had our son. I was seen by the doctors and the doctor was so concerned. You know, she knew that something had happened. She knew, I mean, the way she was questioning me, she knew that, um, you know, someone had done something to me. So I, I just opened up like, you know, this, this was the second time I'd, I'd said that because the first time I had gone to my GP, my general protect, uh, my doctor, personal doctor, and he had, he had, uh, I'd said what I was going through, like, uh, this is what I'm experiencing. My husband beats me, and I'd take, you know, it had taken such courage and such a long time for me to get to that point of actually verbalizing this to somebody. Mm -hmm. So then I had all my hopes were in this man coming to my rescue. So then, it, as I said it, my husband beats me. He looked at me and said, I'm sorry, I can't prescribe anything for that. I've got, what do you want me to write? Husband, stop beating your wife. So then at that, so this was like a couple of months before, it had kind of like shut me down. But at the same time, he had given me courage that, okay, you know what? If I can do it, if I've done this, I can do it again. I can tell somebody else again. But I'm not sure how or when I was going to do it. Well, so as this, and, as and I this for a moment, do you feel that part of the reason you had not spoken out yet is because there's a part of you that still wants to protect the perpetrator. It still wants to protect the father of your child, your husband, because there's a part of you that is still hoping something will change. Like, did you wrestle with that reality? Is that why you felt like you hadn't come out and said anything yet? Yes, that was one of the reasons, one of the reasons. Yes, I was wanting to be free and not to be treated this way. But at the same time, there was this connection because, you know, being married is not only a physical connection, it's the, the emotions are all tied in there. You know, you, I love this person, but I don't love what they're doing to me, mm -hmm. but I still want to protect them and protect the relationship. So there was all that in there. So when, as I sat uh, opposite this doctor and I was, I was telling her what had happened, she said to me, okay, you know, the, do you want to make a police, um, like, uh, to, 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 to rec uh, report it to the police? And I said, I doubted then. So that's when that Lily, that thing, what you just said, the protecting. So I just, I thought for a moment that, oh yes, but then I then doubt, I resisted. I said, okay, you know what? I want this to change. I cannot carry on like this and I cannot carry on for my son or raising my son in this kind of situation. So then I said, yes, the doctor said, oh, there's actually a police officer in the building. So she called him over. I gave him a statement. And at the same time, there's that protecting that, you know, there was like snitching, you know, you don't snitch on someone you love and care for, you're supposed to protect them. So I... I, I was feeling bad at the same time, but at the same time, I knew that this was going to be, this needed to be a fight from within me. This is something that I needed to do to bring about yeah. change in my life. So then I gave the statement, but then I said to the police, he still has my son, so please be careful. So um, that was that. The police uh, the police officer went away, uh, got examined, the, the, the doctor... Um, she was such a love. She was she was a godsend, really. I felt so comfortable and so safe. This was around two. I was discharged at two a.m. and she said, "Do you have money for for a cab?" And I said, "No, I don't." And she says, "Don't worry, don't worry about it. I'll get you a cab to get you home." Because uh, during this marriage, I every everyone and everything had been ostracized. My family, I had no fat family anymore. I had no friends. Um, uh, right, that's what they do. They alienate and they shut off all relationships. Yeah. I, yeah, I was completely alone. So then in that in that situation, I yes, at that point too, uh, I wasn't allowed to work. So I, I didn't have any money of my own, any money for anything I had to ask him. Grocery shopping, I had to ask him. Uh, my sanitary stuff, I had to ask him. So completely dependent on this person. Mm -hmm. So then um, I got home. 
uh, and this was around maybe 3 a.m. The following morning, it was the 29th of May, my son's birthday, his sixth birthday. So mm-hmm. around, I think it was around 9 a.m., I think, I'm not sure, um, uh, my then husband uh, came to the door uh, and he knocked this time but the door had already been off its hinges. There was, there was no lock, no anything. So he knocked. So then I went to the door, opened it. And then my son just ran in, gave me a hug, like everything was fine. So to say the happy birthdays, you know, try to put on a happy face for him because it was all for him. But then uh, my husband came, my then husband came in with a big box, you know, a gift, just making just you know it, it was like nothing had happened at all so it's bizarre like, you know, if, if, <laughs> yes yeah, so bizarre I and mean, if I didn't have the bruises and you know the aches and the pains I would have mm-hmm. been thinking to myself did I just imagine all that you know all that happened the day before so he was sweet and then he, he asked me oh so what happened at the hospital and then it, and then I said yes I've got a I had a hairline a fracture and bruises and a torn well, it's got torn tissue. And then uh, he said, oh, um, I've got some salvelin. Do you want me to rub it on you? <laughs> Who are you? I was just like, please, let's go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In my head, I was like, please just go. Because the uh, what I forgot to mention, uh, the night before the doctors, the, uh, at the hospital, the doctor had actually booked me into a women's refuge across mm-hmm. town. So, and I had arranged for someone to come and just, there were just a few belongings, uh, a suit, suitcases and a few things, a taxi to take us. So a taxi was actually waiting outside. Uh, so he, uh, so then I said, uh, no. And then after uh, a little while he left. And then as soon as he left, we just gathered our things, got in a taxi and went to the women's refuge. But then we were still in the same city. I still felt like I felt like I was still in the same situation because I felt like I wasn't far enough. So then I took a, a, a map and then I was like, OK, wh- where where should I go far away from the city? Where sh- where can I go? And then uh, a city, uh, the name of a city, Preston, came up and I just thought, OK, you know what? I'm going to go there. But then first, before I go there, I'm going to ring to see if they've got a women's refuge there. So I rang, um, I looked up on online. There was a, yes, indeed, there was a women's refuge. So I called up and they happened to have a room free. And, but they couldn't reserve it. They said, if you need us to reserve it, you have to come and uh, sign some formal paperwork. So that the following day, got off few bags, went on the train, two hours journey, three hours journey, went uh, to Preston, booked ourselves in. And then that was our like journey now of starting to, to heal. So that was like my exhaling, like, okay. Right. Right. Well, let's let's pause right there because that's going to be the next thing that we get into is the the healing journey and the you know the power of forgiveness, all of that. So let me first um, spend a little bit of time telling you guys a little bit about my story, so you understand where I, my my past and basically in a nutshell, because mine is quite lengthy. Mine was like eighteen plus years. <laughs> of abuse uh in i've had three different families but in my first two families i experienced every form of abuse in the first home um i had been adopted and in that home my parents were old enough to be my grandparents and unfortunately my adopted father was a pedophile and i was his in-home victim of choice right so that began when I was a toddler and that went on until I left that home. I left that home uh, when I was eight years old, but I was approaching my ninth birthday in my second home, which was now with my biological father and my stepmother. I lived with them for the next, the following 10 years. And in that home, I experienced emotional abuse, but also the physical abuse. And I can tell you, having been through so many years of this, that the scarring, yes, there was a lot of the bruises and all those things, the physical part of it, but a lot of the internal bruising and wounds came from the emotional, from the mental abuse, the horrible things that were said to me. Um, So anyway, so I had this particular kind of abuse in this first home, and now I had emotional, mental, and physical abuse, very, very aggressive type of physical abuse, 
from a man who is my biological father. And he was a classic narcissist, as you would know, if you know narcissism, then you totally understand what I'm talking about. Um, and so that went on in this home. In between the two homes, when it's a much longer story, which I will get into another time, but there was custody stuff happening in between. Because remember, I was adopted in this home. He couldn't just take me, <laughs> but he did. <laughs> so in between all of that, I was also abducted. People had been hired to kidnap me. So there was massive trauma in that year and court hearings and all that kind of stuff. So you get the point, like massive trauma, massive abuse, every possible kind of abuse. And at the age of approximately 15 years old, I mean, I had been suicidal for years, but I remember being 15 years old and thinking to myself, okay, how can I commit suicide in a way that is quick and is effective? Because I don't, I don't have weapons. I don't have access to weapons. So how can I do this in a way that I, okay, funny, but not funny. <laughs> but I thought about like, well, if I hang myself, what if it doesn't work? I don't want to be hanging there for a long time. And these were the thoughts going through my mind, right? Like, how, I want this to be quick. I want this to be painless. I want it to be easy. And and I remember this was the first time that I heard the voice of the Lord. Now, you know, my faith journey, that's a whole other story in and of itself. I had always believed in Jesus. I had grown up in a very traditional Catholic home. Um, but, you know, the Bible also says the demons believe and they shudder. So it wasn't enough to believe, right? <laughs> it's not enough to believe. You have to actually ask the Lord to be Lord and Savior of your life. Um, so anyways, that's another story for another time. But I did genuinely in my heart have this love for Jesus I would talk to him frequently and so but I had yet to like hear his voice if you will uh, of course back then I did understand the different ways in which he speaks I've always been an avid dreamer in fact Lynn and I met through the school of dream intelligence um, but at this particular moment at 15 years old pondering how do I kill myself right in a way that's quick easy effective I remember the Lord speaking to my heart and just saying, Lily, trust me, tomorrow will be a better day. And somehow I had this revelation that tomorrow didn't mean the next day, you know, but that it was a promise, something that I could hold on to, that he was leading me to the promised land, that this wasn't the sum total of my life, right? That there was so much more. And I was having to walk through this through this thing. And, you know, oftentimes you hear people say, but why do bad things happen to good people? Well, listen, God didn't create robots, right? He created human beings that have free will. And unfortunately, people choose to do bad things. And that often hurts innocent people in their lives. But then I have a choice. Am I going to repeat the cycle? Am I going to also either marry someone like that or enter into a relationship with someone like that? Or am I going to become a narcissist? Am I going to control and manipulate and abuse people mentally, physically, emotionally, you know, all the different things? Or am I going to choose to break that yeah. cycle, right? And have a better life for myself, a better, a better version of my life. And I didn't know anything about inner healing and I didn't understand the power of forgiveness at that point in time, but I had this promise from the Lord, trust me, tomorrow will be a better day. And just to give you an example. Um, so the, during the time frame that I was with my father and my stepmother and my, my other siblings in that particular 10 year span, the beatings initially were pretty much every day, every single day. As I got older, my father got involved with another woman across, um, we lived in South Texas, and so he got involved with another woman across the border. He actually had two identities, other story <laughs> to be told there. Mm -hmm. I literally could have like a lifetime movie made out of this, but he ha has his other family. So as he gets careless, having an affair, a 14 year affair, birthing two sons with that particular woman, his beatings were not every day but they were more severe. It's almost like he wanted to make up for lost time every time, right? And it was for any reason. He would beat me for, I stepped over a sock and I didn't pick it up. So he would call me all sorts of horrible names. And are you, you know, bleep, 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 blah, like blah, 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 all these horrendous things. And 
my stepmother at the time as well. Now, I didn't realize it initially that she was also being abused, but so she would take a lot of her anger out on me and she would abuse me in the same ways as well, you know, mentally, emotionally, and physically, uh, which, I mean, I totally, I forgive her, of course, but um, I remember thinking at the time, I, I can handle you. <laughs> It's him. It's him that's going to like break me. So fast forward in time, uh, my senior year between the fall semester and the spring semester, he broke his own rules. And when he broke his own rules, what I mean by that is that he lost control. He no longer beat me where he could hide it or cover it. Right. And he had already isolated me from pretty much every human being that there was. He had me grounded for no reason. 360 days out of the year, I had five days where I could be, go do something. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, um, but so that what happened in between the two semesters, just as we were beginning, actually coming back into the spring semester, he broke he lost control he, his punch his fist was meant for my stepmother and because i tried to protect her he turned around and that fist landed on my face but once he broke his own rules once he busted my lip and i landed on the ground it's like something just he was no longer able to control himself if you will he just at that point it's like okay well i already broke my own rules so here we go feet hands everything right? Everything all over my body. So by the time I go to school, this is on Saturday, by the time I go to school on Monday, you know, bruising goes through, um, through faces, right? From like dark to green, to bur like all those things. Um, my friends took notice. One of my closest friends noticed. And interestingly enough, my father had always controlled even my wardrobe, but because he was having an affair and he was leaving the home at a certain time, he wasn't paying attention to what I put on that day. And thankfully I got away with wearing a little mock neck, like crew sleeves, like, you know, the short little cap sleeves um, and a little skirt. And when you sit down, a skirt hikes up a little bit more. So a friend noticed Long story short, that led to her and the professor getting me to an LPC, a licensed professional counselor, who was a complete godsend. I will never forget this. All of the, all parents knew of the high school counselors. Everyone was aware of a high school counselor, but no parent was aware of the hidden office. There was this secret place where kids in my kind of situation could find safe refuge. Right, where I didn't have to be afraid of my father finding out about that particular licensed professional counselor. And yes, she should have called CPS. Yes, she should have called the police. That's a whole other story. She, uh, against her better judgment, she puts the phone down and she said, we're going to do two things. You're going to come see me once a week for one-on-one -on -one sessions. And you're going to come see me a second time for group sessions. And I'm going to help you build your confidence. And you're going to run away from that home and you are not looking back. I'm like, okay, that was the plan. <laughs> That was the plan. And so yes, ultimately he lost control again. I have been trying to wait until after graduation because believe it or not, I love my dad and I still wanted him to be at my graduation. There were so many reasons I wanted to protect him. On the one hand, he had always told me, if you ever tell anyone what, I, what I've done to you, it will be that much worse for you. Like he, you know, he controlled me. It's like, I, I am this higher power. You will never get set free from me. And if you so much as try to get help, just watch what's waiting for you. So there was this horrifying fear. I didn't want to tell anyone because I was afraid he was always going to win. But also I had the, the conflict inside of, I love my father. If he happens to go to prison, if the police happen to believe me and he doesn't win, what about, what about my sisters? I don't want to take our father away from my sisters and who's going to provide for us and all these mixture of emotions. It's so conflicting. I was like, I love him. I don't want him to go to prison, but I don't want him to hurt us and all of those horrible things. And fast forward in time, I did run away um, because he lost control again. And I'm like, okay, he, this is not a safe place. I have got to get out because he, because he had broken his own rules, it was only a matter of time before he accidentally, if you will, killed me. Because at this point, it never would have been premeditated murder, but the rage was just escalating, escalating. And so I just knew this is not safe. I have got to get out now. So 
I ran away and I remember making a very distinct choice. And this is an important part of my story, which I want you guys to catch because I have a really good friend. She's one of my closest friends. She has a master's in counseling. She has uh, done internships with women that have gone through situations like, like Lynn and I. And a lot of those women, because you know they wrestle with the unworthiness and I'm not valued and like, look at what was done to me. So I must have no worth and no value. They turn to self-destructive tactics to cope, whether that be prostituting their bodies, drugs, alcohol, cutting, jumping back into the cycle or being the perpetrator, you know, whatever. Like these are generally the paths or they kill themselves like suicide. And so my friend said, you know, I work with all these women who have gone through the same situations as you and they're wrestling with this addiction. They're wrestling with this, that, and the other. It's like, how are you normal? (laughs) That's often the question, right? And she's not the only one to ask me that. And, And I want to tell you this. First, let me start with the power of choice. I remember looking at my father, and I'll circle back to you, Lynn, but I remember looking at my father, his life, and the choices that he had made. And sure, he had his own version of the story as to why he justified his behavior, but I saw that, and I thought to myself, I don't want to do that. I don't want to let anger, bitterness, whatever, hatred, self-hatred, ultimately, right? Uh, I, I don't want that in my life. I choose to do better. I choose to pursue a different lifestyle. I made an out loud, deliberate choice. So I want you to know that you can choose different, right? And so I did. I ran away. And guess what I did? I ran away and went to college. But Lily, I don't have money to go to college. Neither did I. I had no one to support me. You know what I did? I worked my way through college because when you want something, you go after it. Nothing is going to hold you back. So I didn't make excuses. I didn't look for charity. No, like, this is what I'm doing. I'm pursuing a better life. And that's it. Like, you know, whatever it takes, that's what I'm going to do. So the next thing was, so there was the, the choice component of it. But a year later, uh, after I'd ran away, gone to college, and of course, there was a lot of harassment in those first six months initially, but I had come to visit. I finally met my birth mother. That's another story. But a cousin of mine had picked me up at the airport and she said, Lily, one day, and that's when I found out about the 14 year affair and all of that. And so she tells me about this. And she said, one day your father is going to be on his deathbed and he is going to call your name. What are you going to do? And what an interesting question, right? And can I just tell you that in that moment, my reaction was, I was so full of rage. Like I was just like this bomb, you know, waiting to combust. And she asked that question and I said, he can die and go to hell for all I care. I will never give him the peace of mind. Like that actually grieves my spirit that I even said that. I'm like, I'm so sorry, Lord. (laughs) But that's where I was. That was the realness of the anger and the unforgiveness and the bitterness and of course, fast forward in time, and then I, um, and I'll and I'll tell you about how I stepped into forgiveness and inner healing and all of that. But so this this what I walked out of, and now we're going to circle back to Lynn and tell us about your inner healing journey and how you were able to finally get set free through forgiveness and what the Lord has done. Oh wow, your story, your story, Lily. Yes. Oh. Praise God for, you know, just for who he is. And I love, you know, I I love the authenticity of you having that anger and just, you know, just being real with it because it's there, it's real and it needs to be dealt with though, but it needs to be dealt with in the correct way. Yes, in which of course you made the, the choice. There's always a choice, friends, always a choice. Yeah, so back to me, I, I arrived in this new new city. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anything. I didn't know. Yes, I was just there with my bags and my son, went to this uh, refuge, and, and it was like starting all over again. So that, like, for me, that was also a choice of, okay, they're the comforts, the comforts that you've been used to, you've been used to a nice house, you know, or you're used to nice surroundings, everything that you know. So do you, did, did I really want that over 
taking a risk as it were to start anew because i know some people struggle with that but then you know what my freedom my life the life of my son was way much more important than stuff so anyway we began um we we, we were in this women's refuge for about six months um i, I want i'm just trying to be to be selective because I, I, there's so much there's so much in there, but I just wanted to, to give you the main things of, of what what happened. So uh, when we're in the women's refuge, a, a couple of months went by, but I I was starting to just awaken a bit, but then I just also was aware that my son was going through the same thing, and I didn't want to hamper or hinder my son's relationship with his dad. I still wanted him to have a dad, and I still wanted his dad to be in his life because it's his dad. So then I, I, I called um, his dad and I, I suggest, and then he says, oh, I'm not, and I said, oh, do you want to come and see uh, your son? And he was like, oh yes, I'll, I'd love to come and see him. So I told him where we were, not at the, um, the refuge, but uh, I suggested that we met somewhere in town, in town, in the city center. And I suggested a street somewhere. And then, uh, so he drove up three hours, uh, we arranged a date time, so we went. We were going into into town. So as I was on on my way to see him with 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 my son, I just had a light bulb moment. Hey, what? And yeah, this light bulb moment occurred. And because okay, friends, I was in a new city. I didn't know anything. I didn't know the streets or whatnot. I did, just did the same thing. Oh, there's this street in town. I looked on the map. We'll meet there. But little did I know that there was a police station on that street all this i'm just thinking it was the lord it was the lord <laughs> so anyway on our way i passed this police station and i had a light bulb moment and i just thought okay you know what just in case anything kicks off i'm just gonna let the police know what my situation so i went to the police station spoke to a police officer who was on the reception and i said to her you know this is my situation and um uh, he's coming now to see our son to spend the day with him and then she said to me, oh, do you want me to go out and um, and hand your son to him? And I was like, oh, can you do that? And she says, yes, of course. So I happily uh, um, uh, took up on the offer and then she took my son to him. And then I went on my merry way after she came back and said, yes, um, he, he's with his dad. Not even five minutes went by when I received a call from him calling me every name under the sun because he hadn't actually seen me. He had seen a police officer bring his son. So then I clocked that, okay, you weren't really here to see our son. You were here to see me. So then with that, the calls kept on coming and the insults upon insults. He was supposed to have our son for a few hours for the afternoon. He didn't bring him back. He didn't. So then I was panicked. I rushed back to the police station and I told them what had happened and what he said that he's not bringing him back. So they, he said, they said, okay, now we, we're going to go after him because he's not being threatening and he's threatening your life and he's got your son. So we need to locate him. Could they locate him? No. So I went home. I didn't sleep. I was just blaming myself thinking Lynn what have you done what did you do such a stupid mistake for but then anyway uh the following morning um the police called me they still hadn't found him they'd gone to his place he wasn't there no, nowhere to be seen and then um later on that morning we heard a knock on the door because this was a shared house of, with other women fleeing yeah. domestic abuse we heard a knock on the door and there was my son standing at the door and I was like, oh my goodness. So I grabbed him, shut the door. And then the other ladies knew what had been going on. So they quickly called the police just in case he was still around. They quickly called the police. The police came in no time. He had just dropped our son off and sped off and gone. So then uh, I, I was glad that my, you know, my son was there, but then at the same time he knew where we were and I'd broken the house rules. So then they quickly rehoused me. They found us a lovely home. This was also a godsend, a lovely little house. Um, so we moved the following, not the end of that week, we had moved after a few days, we moved. And then after all that drama, fast forward, I'm not sure when, fast forward, let's say about six months. 
God, um, then my relationship with God had gotten stronger. You know, I was now talking to him and uh, I was uh, I was reading the Bible. I wasn't understanding what I was reading because someone gave me the King James Version, but I was just reading. <laughs> I was just reading the vows and the whatnots. Uh, but on some, you know, some, I was, uh, the New Te- when I read the New Testament, I, I understood it more. But then once I got past Genesis and the rest of them, I was like, I don't know what I'm reading, but you know what, God, I know you're there. I know you see me. And I know this is the, this is the only way, one of the ways I can communicate with you. So, I, and I really wanted to. So I read the Bible every day and I spoke to God every day. And then one day I heard him say to me, Lynn, I want you to apologize to your, he was then my ex-husband, I want you to apologize to him. Excuse me? I know, I was like, what in my head? Me apologize? He should be apologizing to me? But then, you know, in my mind, in my head, I was having this conversation, but in my spirit, there was just such an excitement that this was the right thing to do. So then I took uh, my, my pen and pad and I, I began writing this note. I apologize for, for anything that I may have done that caused him to treat me the way he did. Uh, I mailed that letter and that was it. But then uh, I, in it all, as I was writing, and I, and I think a day or two passed before he contacted me, I was thinking, okay, what was that all about? Why do I have to forgive him? I don't really understand why. So, you know, always just having this conversation with God and with myself, that that doesn't make sense. And that's not fair. You know, like I, I should be the one, you know, he should be feeling sorry for me. Why should I be apologizing to him? So all these conversations I was having um, with myself and with God. So anyway, a couple of days later, he rang me saying that he received the note and he started apologizing and even reminding me of things that I had forgotten, not like, not even like uh, eight, eight or 10 months had gone by. And I just realized, oh my goodness, what's happening? I don't even remember that. You know, like he I was reminding God, you of things he had done to hurt you and you forgot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I had forgotten, yes. He was starting to remind me all like, oh, remember when I did this? Remember when I did that? Or remember when I used to uh, give you um, like, not enough money to go and make groceries and ask for change back when you came you know so all those things that he was reminding me and then I then I now I know that God had kind of like just erased some of these things that I you know then you don't need to remind remember any of this my daughter just just I'll just erase this off your mind and off your memory so I feel that God did that for me yeah and let's let's actually pause there for just one second because I think this is important for the people who are listening who have gone through this Because one of the things that I was frequently told when I would share my story later on after I had received, you know, inner healing and all of that, they're like, Lily, you speak of that girl as if it's somebody, as if it's somebody else. Like, is this this disassociation that you disassociate? Is this a self coping mechanism where, you know, the reason you have blocked memories is because of self defense mechanisms, all these kinds of things. And that's all human wisdom. That's all human logic. But the reality is, is that I felt the Lord speak to my heart and say that, no, that, that is me. I have chosen to edit your memory bank. There are things you do not need to remember. Those things don't need to be on the replay, right? Those things do not need to replay over and over in your head. And so he is so gracious and merciful to just edit out those memories. So continue. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I so agree. I so agree with that. So anyway, as he was reminding me all these things, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, I've forgotten. But then, yeah, so I just let him speak what was on his heart. So he did most of the speaking and the apologizing. And then after, after I hung up, um, I just felt like a, a weight lift that I wasn't aware was there. You know, sometimes you feel you're okay unless the Lord shows you that, you know, you are not okay in your, in your, in your thinking you're okay. So yeah, so just a weight lifted off, off of me. And then I, I knew that, okay, I had chosen to forgive him. I mm-hmm. choose to forgive him because I didn't want, I didn't want anything, you know, yes, I didn't want anything to to still 
you know, to still be linked to him, to still have some sort of cord still attached to him. Mm -hmm. Yes, we had a son together, but then yes, that's all well and good, praise the Lord. But then that was it. So even, I didn't want to even think negatively of him. I didn't want to think positively of him. That was what had happened. I'm moving on and that's it. Mm -hmm. So did, did memories come, some memories come? Yes. Some, some bad memories came back of stuff that had happened, but then I had to always remind myself, no, I've forgiven him. I've forgiven him. I've forgiven him. And what I needed to, to bring to the Lord, God, I give you, I give you this. And in knowing, you know, not, then I didn't know the scriptures as I, as I do now. You know, the Lord says, you know, in the Lord's prayer, it says, for forgive us, forgive us our trespasses as as we forgive those that trespass, God, forgive me as I forgive. Yeah. And then I thought, you know, oh, oh gosh, yes. So God, before even I, before I even knew your word, you were working your word in me. You were yeah. working it in me even before I knew it. So I had to line up with myself when God presented me with the, with the choice. Okay, I would like you to do this. Will you do it? So it wasn't God saying, you need to do it. No, it was, will you do it? So I, when I said yes, that was the result of my yes. So I forgave him. So when I got to know that scripture of forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that, those that trespass against us. They're like, oh my goodness, Lord. Yes, I want to forgive because you've forgiven me just as yeah. you forgive me. I want to forgive that. I don't want to hold unforgiveness and think that you are holding unforgiveness towards me. So yeah, so that helped me along to as well. So God not began to give me the understanding as I read the word that, especially with the forgiveness, because I felt that that was a game changer for me. And with, mm -hmm. with the, even of erasing some, some of the memories, you know, sometimes when we replay, when we replay stuff that, that's happened before, it's like a, still a gateway, a doorway of still uh -huh. being in that pit of unforgiveness and feeling uh, entitled to to be angry well and that's a really good point you bring up because remember in scripture the lord says and i choose to remember your sins no more it's not that god's forgetful yeah. he simply mm. chooses to remove our sins as far as the east is from the west and that's what forgiveness does it doesn't give people a pass it doesn't justify their behavior it's not about well okay i'm saying that what you did is okay no a hundred percent not okay but I'm choosing to forgive because I want to be free. I don't want yeah. to continue in the bondage of resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness. I, you will no longer have control over me. I choose to forgive, not, not so much for their sake, but to set yourself free. Absolutely. Forgiveness is, is, is for you, the person. It's not for them. You just commit them to the Lord and you just do what you, what, what you, what you know the Lord is asking you to do right. and what the word says, and that is forgive. And you know what? It's not in our will or in our might that we're able to, but by his grace, he enables us that grace when we want to allow, allow him to do that. So it's even, it's even that, okay, Lord, I'm willing. I don't want to, but I'm willing. But in my unwillingness, the part that's me that's unwilling, help me with that unwill in that yeah. will. Help me, Lord. Help me be willing. Help me be willing. So it's yeah. it's not a thing of okay, I'm just gonna say this word, these words, I forgive you. But then you know, it's not just it's, it goes far much deeper than that. It has to hit the heart level, it has to completely change your heart and your mindset, yes. even towards that person. Yes, and when you say that, that was the beginning, the forgiveness the choosing to forgive wasn't that the beginning to healing to your heart oh yes absolutely that was i do not think i would have been able to step into full healing without yeah. forgiving that so i say forgiveness was the key forgiveness was the door yes. that led me now to the place of healing of the the lies being stripped away of god unveiling me to me that okay daughter this is the real you that's, that's not right. the real you that you that's you, right. that you know you thought you were but yeah. so yeah so without he without forgiveness i would not have been able to step into into Amen. the fullness of healing and him and, and really knowing that he is my healer he that's is right he met me in Amen. Well, as we are beginning to wrap up, I am going to come back to a little bit to the inner healing and have you pray for those who are watching and listening, Lynn. I 
I want to circle back a little bit back to my story. And when I, when my friend asked me that woman who has a master's in counseling and has done internships, you know, serving people who have gone through these same situations who are in bondage and all that kind of stuff on forgiveness. And when she asked that question of how are you normal, the thing that I shared with you was the power of choice. But now I want to go back to that because there was something else. Yes, there was a, a moment when I made a choice to do different, right? However, how are you normal, Lily? You want to know how I'm normal? It is by the redeeming grace of Jesus Christ. I got saved, born again in 2007 when I made a choice to not just make him savior, but surrender lordship to him, that he is Lord and savior of my life. And that was the beginning. Now that, so the redeeming grace of Jesus, but let me tell you what, when I got born again, and I'll talk about that in just a second as well, I still had all this baggage but the Lord walked me through a journey of inner healing and he was so kind and he was so gentle and he would slowly and gradually peel back layers and okay, daughter, now we're going to work on this. Okay, daughter, now we're going to work on this. And he is such a gentleman, right? And he doesn't force things on us, but he was inviting me into a healing journey. But the beginning of my inner healing was when I chose to forgive. That was the key. That's the door. That's the key that opens the door into your inner healing journey so that you can experience the shalom of God. The shalom isn't just the divine peace, but the wholeness of God in your life. And so I, I had multiple times to be I forgive him <laughs> with that kind of attitude because I knew that I, I need to forgive, right? But that was, it was still with a chip on my shoulder. It was still with a knot in my throat and a weight on my chest. And it wasn't genuine. It wasn't sincere. And I had to walk through that. And it wasn't instant. It didn't happen overnight. But one day, one of the things that shifted for me is when, uh, and I don't know if it was a person that I heard or if it was the Lord somewhere or another, I remember the Lord revealing to me that we are not to come to him in prayer to gossip about another person. He said, I don't want you to come and talk to me about someone else. I want you to come and pray for them, not about them, for them. And that was a perspective shift. So I started coming to the Lord, not to gossip about my narcissistic abusive father, but rather to really ask the Lord for his heart. Lord, how do you want me to pray for him? And then I would pray healing to his heart and healing to his body because he was also crumbling physically and all these different things. As, as I began to actually pray the father's heart over my biological father, there was a softening of my heart. Something happened. And one day as I was driving to work, I remember driving and just saying, Lord, I forgive my father. And that time I felt I, what, that heaviness just lifted off of me. And I could have done the happy dance in the car, except that I was driving. So I couldn't stand up and start shouting hallelujah and dancing because I'm driving. But I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, this is real. Like I, I feel the shackles. They just came off. It just, everything just came crashing down. I felt this release and this freedom and fullness. And it was the beginning to my inner healing journey. And so Lily, how are you normal today? By the redeeming grace of Jesus Christ, number one. Number two, the power of forgiveness. And number three, the power of allowing the Lord to take us through that inner healing journey, not because he's pointing out your imperfections, the areas where you need to get it together. No, the places where he wants to bring truth and healing and call you to a higher place. And one last thing I will say when it comes to um, being born again, when people were like, Lily, how do you talk about your story? How do you share about that those moments of your life, those 18 plus years of your life, as if you're speaking of someone else, it's because I am speaking of someone else. Okay, hear what I'm about to tell you. <laughs> okay, this isn't disassociative disorder, whatever, whatever. In 2007, when I gave my life to the Lord and I confessed him as Lord and Savior of my life, I also got water baptized. And can I tell you that scripture says this is not a symbolic act. No, this something real happens in the spirit realm that when you get buried in the waters of baptism, the old man gets buried in the waters of baptism and you rise again, a new creation in Christ. 
I rose again, a new creation in Christ. I didn't have to carry all that baggage. I didn't have to carry all that bondage. That is no longer me. I'm a new creation, hallelujah. Yes, I still had emotional things I had to work through and allow the Lord to bring healing to my heart, but I'm not that girl. I'm a new creation in Christ. And that is why I can sit here today and tell you my story without crumbling. <laughs> because I'm new. I'm a new creation. And yes, I'm still walking out a lot of different things. We, we never arrived, you guys. You know, I've received tremendous breakthrough. I've received inner healing in those areas of my life. But we're always going through the process. We're never going to graduate the process. There's always something that the Lord is walking us through and teaching us. Um, and so we can do it with grace. We can do it with freedom. We can do it with joy. And so, yes. So there you go. Those are my keys. <laughs> Oh, man, I would love for you to just tie up uh, the importance of inner healing and then just lead us in prayer for those who are listening who, who want to experience such freedom. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, when when God says to you, come to me as you are, just go as you are. Don't feel like, okay, I have to have this all together or that all together. No, if, if, if you're in a place of, of not being able to forgive, just go to God and go with him with, with just being authentic because that's what he works with. So yes, yeah, so that'll be your key to, your, to open that door of forgiveness and inner healing as well to make you healed and whole because that's what Christ came for, to make you whole. So I, I just bless you in that. Yes, I bless you to be able to just go to your father who loves you and who knows your situation better than you know it yourself. You know, he's there for you. He knows what's happening. He knows exactly what you need to do, how you need to do it, and when you need to do it. So there's no need to, to, try, to feel like you have to handle it all yourself. No, he's there. And he's there to be your healer, to, to, to be your balm, you know, from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. You know, the scripture says it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So let's walk in that freedom, friends. Let's just come out of the pit of unforgiveness. You know, he, Christ has already set us free. He's already uh, taken the shackles and opened the prison doors. So we just have to walk out of it. So just walk out and experience this freedom in Christ that he has for you. So I just bless you with a blessing of the Lord. And I just pray that as you as you just uh, open your heart to, to what's been shared, I just pray that you'll have a powerful encounter with the Lord that will radically transform your life, that you know you'll actually just walk away days, weeks, and months and just look back and think, oh my goodness, I, I, I don't do this anymore. I don't feel like that anymore. I feel differently. I feel lighter. I feel there's just, I feel new. I feel clean. Father, Lord God, to everyone who responds to what you, you've said through us today, Father, just meet them at their point of need, Lord God. Meet them at their point of need. We bless them, Father. We say we commit them to you because you are the one who makes all things new. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. And you guys, the Bible says in the book of Revelation that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So we are able to overcome and live from our seat of victory because he has overcome, because he shed his blood for you, but also by the power of our testimony. So as you're hearing this message, as you're hearing our testimony, allow that to, to bring freedom to your heart. Invite Holy Spirit to come to those places of your heart that you've, you know, it's like your heart is a house. And there's been doors that maybe you've allowed him access to, rooms you've allowed him access to, but then there's certain doors that you've kept locked and you've kept the master key. And it's time to give the Lord the master key and allow him to step into those places where there's darkness, where there's wounds, where there's all that kind of stuff and allow him to unlock and bring light and bring truth, bring healing, bring deliverance to your life because nobody wants to live in bondage. <laughs> <laughs> don't go back to Egypt. Don't go back to the vomit. Step into the freedom that Christ has for you. So I just want to encourage you with that. Thank you, Lynn, for sharing your story. Thank you for joining me today. And you guys, I bless you. And I will see you on the next episode. Thank you for watching and have a blessed day. Bye-bye.